So I'm Writing a Novel is the show where you join me, Oliver Brackenbury, on the journey of writing my next novel, from first ideas all the way to publication and promotion. In this one-man reality show, I'll share with you my ever-evolving thoughts and feelings on how I write, being a writer, and everything that entails at each stage of the process. I'll also answer listener questions and, sometimes, interview special guests. If you're the kind of person who likes to learn how things are made and get to know the people making them, then this is the show for you. Today I'm speaking with Jason Ray Carney, who I first became aware of when he was on a panel at CyclopsCon last October, so 2020, for the best sword and sorcery of the 20th century. Jason is many things. He is a university professor, he is a writer, including, yes, of sword and sorcery fiction, and he is an editor of a magazine that caught my eye, Whetstone, amateur magazine of pulp sword and sorcery. Whetstone has recently been joined by Witch House, an amateur magazine of cosmic horror. But, as you can imagine, Whetstone has caught my eye a little more. It's also the older, more established of the two magazines. And, as you may have heard me mention in one or two interviews with other people, the Whetstone magazine Discord server has been a really cool hangout for meeting other sword and sorcery writers and enthusiasts and discussing that genre for me and others. <laughs> But for me in particular, these last couple of months uh, since I recorded this in mid-November. So between writing Sword and Sorcery, editing Sword and Sorcery for a magazine, and fostering a Sword and Sorcery community, wow, it shouldn't be too hard to understand why I was very curious to speak with Jason Ray Carney. And on top of that, he also has written all kinds of marvelous articles about the genre, which I have linked to in our show notes today, so you can check them out for yourself. Without further ado, let's get talking to the man himself. And here we are with Jason Ray Carney. Hello, Jason. Hello. It's really fun to meet you, man, especially since I've been kind of playing in your uh, sandbox for the last couple of months uh, on the Whetstone Discord, but uh, we will discuss that further along. I'd really like to just get into it here with you by asking, where did your creative writing uh, journey begin? What was the earliest that you recall writing uh, for creative satisfaction? Never mind publication. Oh, I, I've been creative writing for years. I remember I had a copy of Hero Quest, the board game. Yes. And there were the quests, you know, the book, you have to set up the board and you, there's different levels. And I remember, you know, I would create my own adventures for that. That's, that's probably the earliest I can think of actually writing like narratives. Then I was like, oh, I don't actually have to create adventures. I can just write the stories. And so I guess if we put a grade on it, maybe like the fifth grade, I started writing creatively. I was also drawing a lot too. So there was often like drawings of a wizard blowing up a skeleton with a fireball with the stories I was writing. <laughs> nice. And, and and when did you go from that to what you might call more serious, what quote unquote more serious, like maybe you were writing with hopes of getting a novel published or something of that effect? Well, so much of this is going to be tied to like my gaming experience too, because I love fantasy literature and I love Dungeons and Dragons. And in my imagination, imagination. They're like completely part of the same hobby, if you will. Yeah. So I played D&D &D all through high school and wrote horrible D&D &D fiction all through high school. And then I got to undergrad and I majored in creative writing and would submit these fantasy stories and my creative writing uh, professors like, these are horrible. You know, you need to write what you know, write what you know. And I'm thinking to myself like, this is what I know. <laughs> I play these games all the time. But for a while, I started writing literary fiction. And I'd say about 2001 to 2009, I considered myself a literary fiction writer. I actually have some short fiction published that's literary literary fiction. One of my stories that I'm really satisfied with is, for example, it's not fantasy. It's about a doctor's illicit affair with his intern and she's meditating on whether or not she's going to have an abortion. And I was very much trying, trying to channel David Foster Wallace. And so like I went down that kind of literary fiction rabbit hole for a while. Did you do a lot of like creative workshopping of your work? Did you do the, the, the kind of classic literary creative workshop where you and like 10 other people sit around and try not to be too mad while the room tears your stuff apart? Oh, yeah. Yeah. The, uh, the creative writing workshop has been a part of my life since undergrad. Yeah, I did that in graduate school. I started teaching. Actually, my my um, appointment at Christopher Newport University where I teach is actually in creative writing. I teach creative nonfiction, you know, so memoir is like the opposite of, the, of my genre of choice at this moment. Right. But um, the creative writing workshop is something I'm, I'm very much familiar with. OK, well, when we're done this interview, man, I should talk to you a little bit about a book I just read called Craft in the Real World, Rethinking Fiction Writing and Workshopping by Matthew Salesis. Uh, which oh, yeah. uh, it's just it's really neat and a big as the title suggests it's very much about trying to rethink how that whole process goes uh it's just pretty interesting stuff and i you might dig it but yeah. uh but yeah so when did you make the transition from your literary work to your um 
adult as in you are an adult, uh, fiction writing, pardon me, fantasy writing. It's interesting because my degree is in literature and I'm going to back up a little bit. So my master's degree, I did my master's thesis on working class literature. I uh, come from a working class family, central Ohio. My dad's a house painter. My mom, she worked at the Dairy Queen. She's a service worker. So I, I always like, you know, love this idea of working class literature. And when I got my MA in English, I did my thesis on John Steinbeck and the Grapes of Wrath. Then I worked on George Orwell and all of his activist journalism from the between the wars period. And then when I went on to PhD in literature, I was like, well, what am I going to write my dissertation on? I'm still going to do this working class thing. And um, dominant approach towards the between the wars period was modernist literature. T.S. Eliot was more of a critic at that point rather than a creator, but people were talking about like modernist literature, like this high art literature. Specifically, what was in vogue for studying modernist literature was print culture. People were asking the question like, why do we have this crazy experimental literature in the between the wars period? The insight when I was in graduate school was it has to do with the print culture. The reason why modernists were able to, you know, people like James Joyce and T.S. Eliot and Ezra Pound were able to write this extreme experimental literature was because they had a print media called The Little Magazine. It was subsidized. There was a patron usually behind the subscription levels were really low. So they didn't have to quote unquote make money. They could just do what they wanted to do. My intervention was I really don't care for, I think some modernist literature is interesting, but like if I'm going to sit down to read a book, I'm not going to read James Joyce's Ulysses. I've read it and it's a beautiful accomplishment, but that's not what enthralls me. In high school, what kind of got me involved in literary studies in general was reading J.R.R. Tolkien. And let's be honest, I'd even be less fancy than that and say R.A. Salvatore got me into literary studies. Hey man, whatever does it. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm like, oh, I got to do this working class literature stuff. I want to do the between the wars period. You know, I really like to actually go back to like my interest in fantasy. Oh, the Pulp Fiction magazine. It checked the box of working class. It checked the box of fantasy. And it checked the box of what was popular at the time, which was print culture. And I started studying Pulp Fiction magazines. And there's a guy named Jeff Shanks. He did a magazine called Skelos. It was supposed to be a brand new contemporary pulp magazine. I met Jeff through just pulp fiction fandom and Robert E. Howard fandom. And Jeff was like, will you submit a nonfiction essay about Robert E. Howard to Skelos? And I was like, you know what, Jeff, would you consider like accepting something like a fantasy story? And he's like, I, I didn't know you were a creative writer. I'm like, well, yeah, but I, I usually do literary fiction. And he's like, oh, yeah, okay, we'll see what the other guys think. Because there were two other people working on it. So I wrote up a fantasy story. And that was my first publication in fantasy. And it felt really good to actually like get feedback and I took it very seriously. That was the story called a one less hand for the shaping of things. As someone who is still relatively new to this, but has been studying the hell out of it in the time he has been into it, mm -hmm. I have over and over again heard good things about Skelos. And even though it's sort of not alive, I think right now, I'm not yeah. sure if it's still going or if it's been on and off in its existence. I think that your first fantasy story being published in that is really cool. I think that's a great, like, not that you need me to validate you. I just, I'm just saying that's my feeling, you know, I think that's really a, a great step in there. No, no, there was so much hope for that publication and there was so much support for it. And I don't know what happened. <laughs> so. Yeah, I'm, honestly, that's kind of a mystery. I feel like I'm, I'm going to one day interview the, the guest who knows. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> And uh, I'll share it with everybody. Yeah. Um, speaking of publications, could you please tell us the origin story of Whetstone, amateur magazine of sword and sorcery? A couple of years ago, I have to think, to think about this. If there's actually a genesis or if it was just a lark. Um, I mean, it's okay if the story is we sent a bunch of emails and then we started a thing. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'd always wanted to start a literary magazine. I worked on some literary magazines in graduate school as like a slush pile reader. I had done work on academic journals, The Dark Man, the journal of uh, Robert E. Howard and Pulp Studies. I co-edited that with my wife, uh, Nicole Immelheinz. I always had this intention of starting a magazine, but in literary fiction, you don't pay. So there's no baggage associated with like sending out your story. And it's like, you get it published and it's like, it, a lot of these people who are getting their stories published in literary magazines are academics. And so they have the annual review and just getting a publication is, is enough. And that model, I think it works for me, you know, um, I mean, obviously like it doesn't for a lot of genre writers, like genre writers, there's a whole history of like exploitation and like not paying people the appropriate amount of money. And there's the SFWA, you know, rates. And so like, I never want to do a literary fiction magazine. I want to do a sword and sorcery magazine. That's my genre of choice. But I was like, how do I do this? Because I don't have any money and I don't want to exploit anyone. And I just, I had had friends who wanted to write fantasy and submit it for publication. But you look at something like the acceptance rates of the magazine of fantasy and science fiction, and it's like less than 1%. So it's like, I'm not going to waste my time. I'm just, uh, if I write this stuff, it's just going to be for my friends. So I'm like, I thought back to zines like Amra. I, I was participating in what's called the Robert E. Howard United Press Association, an amateur uh, zine. And sometimes people will publish short fiction in that. 
like, what if I was just like, uh, I don't have any baggage with just saying it's for amateurs, right? It's just for amateurs. It's just, to, you know, we're just doing this to showcase our work and it's going to be free. And, and that was the genesis of Whetstone was like, try to take this literary fiction model of like, it's not about making money. It's just about kind of sharing it. And a lot of these literary fiction magazines are free. You, you can go to their websites and just read the fiction. So can you take that model and apply it to genre in such a way that it's respectful? And I thought like the honorarium is important. You have to actually pay something. And that's the background to Whetstone. Okay, yeah. And I, I gotta say, like, everything you just said is confirmed the vibe I picked up off the website. You know, I really liked the look and feel of Whetstone, not just the fact that, like, you know, the stories and the art. I think you guys get pretty cool art for your, your cover issue and stuff. But there was also this feeling of, like, I think these people respect writers, you know, is the feeling I really got. And don't just see them as, like, a source of work via the, mm -hmm. slush, uh, the slush pile. And so it's on the website. People can check it out, of course. And I will link the bejesus out of it in the show notes. <laughs> Thank you. But as someone is listening, uh, maybe they will wouldn't mind hearing. Could you tell us the gist of what you look for in submissions? And as a sort of sub-question to that, I think it's very interesting. You implore people not to send in their best work. <laughs> Could you please explain why that is? Um, absolutely. I think 2,500 words, if you send it off and it's published in Whetstone and you've given away your first North American serial rights, that's important. And I'm not a copyright lawyer. I'm not completely sure like why the stakes are high, but the stakes are high when you publish something in a magazine. A lot of like high paying markets, they don't want it after it's been published somewhere. People want to actually have their work showcased publicly, but they also don't want to give it away for free. So the thought was like, well, you check two boxes if you do the 2500 word. The first box is you're not taking away too much of hard labor from a writer. And the second one is it, it serves this artistic kind of crucible function of you have to tell a story succinctly, methodically, thoughtfully. Well, limits are useful, man. I mean, that's another thing that maybe drawn to Weston 1500, as low as 1500 words up to 2,500, man, like that's a nice little window. And that is, it's, I'll tell you, it worked on me. I've got an outline I'm starting for a story I want to try and submit to you guys. That I was just like, I could do that. If it was 5,000, I, I would hesitate yeah. to be honest. Cause I'm <laughs> absolutely, I mean, 5,000 words, I don't know about you, but I'm a slow and methodical writer. And it's really hard to let loose of 5,000 words of hard work. If it's going to be in something like a free and open access magazine, I, I want it in print. I want a physical copy. If it's that, if it's that. Mm -hmm. So if I understand correctly, the reason you say like, hey, guys, like submit your work, we're going to check it out. We're looking for fast paced sword and sorcery stories, but don't send us your absolute best thing ever because we understand maybe our place in the hierarchy. Is that the feeling of like? Well, the function of Whetstone is supposed to be to introduce you to editors. And I'm not tooting our horn. I'm not trying to like flex or anything, but I know a lot of like really successful, well-known fantasy writers who read Whetstone. Right. I, I won't drop their names because, well, I'll drop one name. David C. Smith, he reads Whetstone, which is pretty cool. You know, he's like one of the great sword and sorcery writers. And, right. you know, like if you get published in Whetstone, then you're going to be read by David C. Smith. David C. Smith was actually telling me about, there was this concept of the B-list. There were writers in the 1970s and 80s who could make a living as novelists because there was enough money in the field where you might not be this bestseller author, but you didn't have to have a job at a sideline, right? Like your main job was a writer and you could still publish novels. And that doesn't exist anymore. I'm not sure if this is true or not from experience, but Dave said that there aren't options for, for you to get your name out there. Am I making sense? No, no, you're making perfect sense. I, I understand. You're, yeah, you're talking about this thing, which I... Again, I won't speak like I'm omniscient and I'm God here, but certainly everything I see points to the mid-list of publishing, the mid-list of filmmaking, the mid-list of art, the middle class of our society, uh, just being ground down by the uh, you know, the villain under the bed is always capitalism. Yeah. And oh, so, you know, I, I, as I've said in another interview, I believe part of the fun of reading some of these authors from the 60s and 70s or even earlier is the fantasy of making a living at, while not having to be a Stephen King or a J.K. Rowling, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And so to that, I think what you're, if I understand what you're saying is that what part of what you want Whetstone to do is kind of help provide kind of, if not mid-list pay, mid-list exposure. Mid-list exposure. Absolutely. Absolutely. I'm gonna, I might uh, steal that language and incorporate it into the description of the magazine, mid-list exposure, because you really do need a way of connecting to readers other than there's, there's the traditional route and then there is the um, self-publishing route. I think of Whetstone as like part of the traditional route. It's a way of just saying, I exist, I can write, here's an example of my style. And there have been people who have published in Whetstone who didn't take themselves seriously as writers. They were like, oh, I'm just a hobbyist. My favorite story is the writer who would never have written fiction, never submitted it to a magazine who goes out of the way to submit to Whetstone and then they start submitting to other markets afterward. Well, I love that because, yeah, people need validation from the outside and self-publishing. Sure, you might have readers tell you they loved your book and that has great value. 
But it's not something you can then turn around if you want to go the traditional route and say, well, these readers love me. The publisher will be like, yeah, but has another publisher already taken a gamble on you? Has a literary magazine already taken the gamble on you? Nobody wants to be the first person to take the gamble. Yeah. So it's nice to hear that, well, I say nobody, but with an asterisk, because here you are doing that with Whetstone. And I think that has incredible value to helping writers develop their careers. So, you know, two thumbs up, man. I love it. There's, there's nothing worse than writing a story, 7,000 word, pour your heart out, revise, edit, polish, submit it to a magazine. You get that like one line response, you know, thank you for submitting. Four months pass, and then you get the form rejection. It's like, screw this, I'm not doing this. Like that's the experience that I want Whetstone to be an antidote to. You know, like the idea of like personalized feedback is really important. I think we had 60 submissions to issue four. That's not a lot for a magazine. So Heroic Fantasy Quarterly, I remember seeing an update on Facebook. They got like 300 submissions. Whetstone got 60. We gave thoughtful responses to everyone who submitted. I mean, and we read it closely and there were four people who read it and we all like commented and discussed. And Very cool, man. That was awesome. Uh, yeah, no, I, everything you're saying, like this is such a big part of why I wanted to talk with you because you guys do a good job of conveying this spirit. I mean, I wanted to talk with you to get these details and get them out to listeners, but it just, God damn, you, you guys have a good attitude. <laughs> oh, thank and you. And <laughs> it shouldn't be, like, maybe that sounds like a low bar to clear, but man, not a lot of people clearing it. So, <laughs> Well, you don't want to waste your time like doing this stuff if it just makes you feel alienated, like nobody has read, nobody has, you know, like, okay, let me be honest. If I write like a really long story, I will still submit it to a magazine of fantasy and science fiction just because. I'd probably get rejected. You never know. <laughs> yeah. You but never it, know. The rejection only takes like two days. So why not have them reject it? Yeah. You know? Well, yeah, it's a quick turnaround. For me, the, the thing that always makes me pull a real face is when I am looking at where to submit my next story and somewhere is like, yeah, no simultaneous submissions. Only us, six months reply time or something like that. Yeah. <laughs> and it's like, motherfucker, you're, <laughs> you're going to make me take like seven years to get this thing. Like, like if, you, if all the markets behave that way, you know, it would take half my life to try it, to try and sell six stories, you know? So it's this kind of thing where like, I totally have sympathy for like the slush pile being too big, but that's why you place a, a, you know, you have windows of submission instead of all year round or whatever, you know, or you just get ruthless about like first sentences with typos or something. I don't know. But like, I just feel like there's a way of dealing with it that's better than making writers have to give up so much of their time waiting to get a, a yes or a no on what is a relatively short read. But of course, I'm hugely biased. I am not an editor of a magazine. Very easy for me to say. So moving on, there is something I want to ask you. I uh, noticed in an interview for Blackgate, you said the following, I am a big fan of strange language, older technical, esoteric, and liter liturgical language. George Orwell wrote an essay about the plain style titled Politics and English Language, and in that essay, he argues against complexity and language. Uh, I, this is you speaking still, I love Orwell, but I disagree with that argument. I think a demand for a plain style is a demand for a mind to be juvenile and unimaginative. Now, I can see one easily saying this as a writer or as someone reading for pleasure, but how do you feel about elevated language or someone really, you know, really trying to be a, the next Vance, uh, you know, let's say, mm -hmm. when reading as an editor working through a tall stack of submissions? Does it give you pleasure? When you're reading through submissions for what's done to find someone trying to be, you know, like I say, like a Vance or, or otherwise perfectly, you know, do a big elevated language thing or or you're, are you kind of like, ah, geez, this is fun to read normally, but this is kind of a work thing. Like, eh. I can't speak for Chuck E. Clark or Luke Dodd or Jace Phelps, who is another reader, but I always like sit forward when I'm reading a manuscript that has like artistic ambition. I really like the idea of taking the pulp genres and being very artistically ambitious with them because the writers and weird tales that we remember were very artistically ambitious. Like Clark Ashton Smith, H.P. Lovecraft, mm. and Robert E. Howard, like they were writing in the pulps because, well, not Robert E. Howard, but Clark Ashton Smith and H.P. Lovecraft, they were writing in the pulps because no one else would understand them. The phrase that Clark Ashton Smith used to refer to his fiction was like the literature of the human aquarium. There's this phrase that he used to talk about how like most literature being written in the between the wars period was completely unimaginative and they couldn't think beyond terra firma. So he was like, oh, I, I guess I'm going to slum it here in this. It's like really snobbish and I'm not snobbish, but I also like the idea of the combination of like pulp and artistic ambition. You know? So I, I guess I like when people use that. Okay, cool. Yeah. So you're into it even as a submission because I, I have to wonder about that. Sometimes people will say they like something and it's like they might like it as a, someone who appreciates it, but when they have to grind through it for their work, they might feel differently. But yeah, no, I think elevated language is really cool, man. I, I love reading people going for it, even if... If they are trying to just do like a direct imitation of Clark Ashton Smith or Jack Vance or C.L. Moore, who I think has a, her own very distinctive style as well, any of the old masters, 
at least they're trying something. At least you know, like, okay, this is someone finding their own voice because that's how it goes, right? You you imitate people, generally speaking, first anyway. Mm -hmm. And then you find your own voice uh, as you graduate out of that. So, yeah. I also have really strong calluses for reading bad writing because I'm an English professor. Oh, I bet, eh? Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> I teach freshman composition and that's a required class. And so if you've read 60 essays by engineers who are like begrudgingly taking your class and I'm forcing them to write about the David Foster Wallace story, then like you very quickly learn to be tolerant of bad prose. So <laughs> to take that for a grain of salt. Oh no, that's a good point. Eh? Oh man, I, I, I have an engineer buddy who still occasionally bitterly you know, recounts having be made to form the proper sentence. <laughs> um, but <laughs> Those They're my worst do. students. It's like the really super smart engineer who's like, why do I have to take this English class? And who is this man telling me to read? You know, why do I have to know how to convey my ideas to others? <laughs> yeah. Uh, sorry to any engineers listening. I love you guys. But uh, we will have our faults and that's what and follies. And that's definitely one I, I encountered a fair amount. I knew too many engineers, it seems, when I was in school. I love them, too. So if, if yeah, I, I'm yeah, not, I'm not giving them a hard time. <laughs> So you're not just an editor for Whetstow, and you also serve as the academic coordinator for the Robert E. Howard Foundation, a fact that really made my eyebrows shoot up when I was doing my research for this. Could you please tell us how you wound up in that role and what it entails? Honestly, it's one of those positions that is very amorphous, and I'm not really sure how I became the academic coordinator. I I think I went to Robert E. Howard days. I've been participating in what's called the Robert E. Howard United Press Association for a long time. It's like fans of Robert E. Howard write one or well, sometimes they're like 30 pages, but mostly they're like one to like four page zines. And we all submit them to this editor of the United Press Association, and he collates them and he sends them to all the contributors. So it's kind of like an amateur press association. There's a science fiction history of those things. Mm -hmm. So I've been in that for a while. They have this thing at Robert e. Howard Days called the Glenn Lord Symposium. It's an academic symposium where like three... Sorry, if I could just pause for a second. Robert e. Howard Days, for those who don't know, that is basically the grand pilgrimage to the village he was born and raised in, in Texas, right? Mm-hmm. And it's like their big tourist event each year. The, the townspeople will come out for it. His house is like a little museum. Am I correct? I've only heard about it. I haven't been. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. His um his house is a museum. They have a lot of his personal effects. If they don't have his personal effects, they have period appropriate versions of something that he might have. So like one of the coolest things is they've almost recreated the sun porch room where he would type up all of his Conan stories. It's kind of roped off so you can take a picture. It's very similar if you go to like the Poe Museum or like the Steinbeck Center. Like it's like an author's kind of celebration museum and it exists for this pulp writer. It's really cool. Part of the annual festival, there's an academic stream and they have people who submit. Most people who who submit at Robert Howard Days are more interesting than academics. They're like comic artists or game designers or, you know, actors. But then there's this one little thing where you have academics. And I did that several years in a row. And it's like, oh, this guy is clearly into Robert Howard and he's an academic. So, and then Rusty Burke, the president of the Robert Howard Foundation, asked me if, if I would take on this role. And I basically just kind of, if there are graduate students who I see publishing in Pulp Fiction or, or they're interested in Robert Howard, I, I basically go out of my way to like say, hey, you should su- consider submitting to TDM or coming to the Glenn Lord Symposium or participating in the Robert Howard Foundation. And I also like um, the Robert e. Howard Foundation board organizes the R- Robert e. Howard days programming and i'm on the email list for that too so a lot of people have like named roles but we all kind of serve this just organizing robert e. howard days committee role okay so yeah so maybe the roles aren't the, you know the actual title of academic coordinator is not as important as this the fact that you're one of many facilitators of keeping the academic discussion alive of robert e. howard yep. and participating in this fan community yep. and keeping it alive yeah would that be fair can i also say because i don't want to take credit for something that i didn't create the glenn lord symposium was created by jeff shanks who was also the founder of skelos hmm. it was his idea to actually bring academics into robert e. howard fandom so okay this question has a bit of a long run-up but i think it'll be worth it i also in that interview with blackgate which i really enjoyed oh thank you uh here's some other stuff you said that will get me to my question Question, which I, I'm very curious to hear your answer. In this, you said, one of my favorite pro stylists is a literary critic slash mystic named Walter Benjamin. Benjamin's writing has an almost ritual magic dimension to it. To read certain passages of Benjamin is to jettison basic foundations of genre. We wonder what we are reading. Is this philosophy, mysticism, poetry? Reading Benjamin is to have a spell cast over you. Consider this brief passage from an essay he wrote about the philosophy of history. And then there's this sentence you suggested. So this is Benjamin now. The only historian capable of fanning the spark of hope in the past is the one who is firmly convinced that even the dead will not be safe from the enemy if he is victorious. Back to your voice. 
How strange. This could be lifted straight from the Necronomicon. <laughs> but if we sub-vocalize the text slowly, read it at the speed of exhalation hospitably, we might find a jewel-like insight. Historians need to deploy radical compassion if they are to give people hope about the future. If we gaze into the past and only see enemies and failures who deserve contempt, how are we ever going to, quote, fan the spark of hope, end quote, i.e. give people a vision for something new? So this really gripped me, partly because you're right. Like, holy crap, read that prose. Like, that's, that sounded like straight out of a, you know, it could have been a Conan or some other story. I love that, man. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> so just, yeah, on your recommendation, I, uh, I, listen, I've already put a, a copy of his book, uh, Walter Benjamin, uh, Illusions on Hold with my library. I'm going to check this stuff out, man. This brought me to what I was thinking here. Sword and sorcery is virtually always set in a distant past or a secondary wor uh, world, you know, analogous to some point in our distant past. How might this genre give people something I think most of us are craving these days, which is a vision for something new? Given that it's so rooted in this past, but then we look at what you're saying about Benjamin here, you know, how, how might sword and sorcery be something that could kind of inspire people for the way things could be moving forward in a positive sense? You know, because I definitely from a lot of conversations I've been having as I've been putting together this project of my own and doing the podcast, I think... I think the, the way that sword and sorcery can be really empowering and uh, can give a sense of, of agency to people who maybe don't feel it as often as they might like, especially in some of the, you know, light of a lot of the overwhelming news we're all having a good time with uh, the last couple of years. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I think that's a big part of why sword and sorcery could maybe get picked up again is because it has that to offer in a positive bent, not just swords and monsters being cleaved in half or whatever. Yeah. So I'm, I'm curious in the context of, of the, the fact that it's so rude in the past, how could it do you think, um, give us a vision for something new in light of the kind of thing we, I just quoted there? It's really interesting because I might go dark a little bit for a second. Go for it. Recently, I wrote this um, libretto adaptation of Elie Wiesel. Elie Wiesel wrote Night. He's a Jewish writer. He writes about the Holocaust. Trial of God is about when he was in the concentration camp, he saw three rabbis putting God on trial. And he like writes this allegory of this trial that he saw in the concentration camps. I'm like in this mind space right now thinking about the Holocaust, which is a really dark place to be. Because of this, I was reading Victor Frankl's A Man's Search for Meaning. And he was talking about how intellectuals in the camps were, sometimes they were the ones who seemed to be able to kind of transcend the horror that surrounded them. They were able to kind of like withdraw into this kind of rich intellectual life. So, so like, I'm, I'm thinking about this weird stuff. By the way, Walter Benjamin, who was also a Jewish writer, and he committed suicide escaping the Gestapo. Like, he heard the Gestapo were downstairs in this hotel where he was fleeing, and he was like, I'm not letting them take me. So you have this, like, theme of, like, this horrible, dark place and withdrawing into this, like, kind of intellectual life or, like, I don't know if the word escape is the right word, but, well, like, f fast forward to the origins of sword and sorcery. 1932 was the year of Conan. An excellent article that you wrote, which I am linking to in the show notes, by the way. Listeners, please check that out. 1932 was this horrible, horrible year. You have the Heisenberg baby was, a little, a, li a baby was murdered, and the murder of this baby was broadcast all over the, the news. You had the Nazis got the majority and the Reichstag, basically the Weimar Republic was going away. You have the lowest, the Dow ever was in the depression. I mean, you had Hoovervilles everywhere. On top of that, like mm -hmm. Robert E. Howard, I don't like saying this, but he did not like cross planes. Let's just say he did not like living in an oil boom town, right? Like it was, it was the worst for him. He didn't seem happy. He didn't, from what I've read of his letters and so on, he didn't seem like he related to anybody else in this town of roughnecks and oil workers as he would generally sum yeah. it up. Which, which is yeah. hard because a lot of the people there today like accept and celebrate. So it's like, I was like, I, I don't want to like make this, let's move on to like another topic. So, you know, what's all this have to do? Like, I think sword and sorcery, it celebrates the ability to kind of withdraw from a horrible situation. I don't know if I should use the term escape because it sounds like it's irresponsible. There's two ways of defending the reading of fiction. One way we defend reading fiction is conviction compels you to confront the real. Like I was talking to my students about the kite runner, the Israeli and the Palestinian conflict, right? It's, it's fiction. The kite runner is fiction. It's not real. It's, it's a story. But when you put that book down, you're going to see the real in a different way. You're going to see the Israeli-Palestinian conflict in a different way because you've read this fiction, right? That's one way of defending fiction is it kind of compels you in a more rich confrontation with the real. Other way of defending fiction is that like it provides for spiritual freedom. It provides for kind of like a retreat from toxic stimuli and it gives you some sort of autonomy that might not exist in your life. And it allows you to kind of construct self in a certain way. I think that that's one of the, uh, the, the sources of Sword and Sorcery's appeal is that it kind of allows you to kind of like all the various institutions that like are trying to define you. Like Michel Foucault has a book called Discipline and Punishment. And he talks about how like there's all these forces that are always trying to kind of tell us who we are, right? This is who you are, and you can't be but this person who I'm telling you who you are. 
And Foucault is interested in these moments of kind of eruption where like we can kind of say back to whoever's telling us who we are, that's not who I am, this is who I am. And I feel like what Sword and Sorcery does is it provides a space for us to kind of speak back to power with a capital P and say, that's not who I am. I'm actually this. I I love what you said there because you hit the nail on the head for certainly a huge part of why I connect with it. I have always loved, regardless of how much I might actually share with the protagonist or the person, if it's a musician or whatever, I've always loved art that is saying, you don't tell me who I am. I tell you who I am. Okay, yeah. And boy, do you ever get that from just about every sword and sorcery protagonist, certainly everyone I've ever read. And I like what you say also about this thing of it's almost like you can escape into that world of sword and sorcery, but sword and sorcery itself doesn't advise you to remain in the land of escape because it's kind of grounded as well as having these fantastic elements. And because it has these protagonists who are fallible and therefore more believable. So when they win, uh, it feels, I don't know, more satisfying to me. And so, you know, but the, during the last couple of years have been so much fun for the reasons we don't need to get into. Uh, and I and I want to get into the, the reasons why I personally also have just been having a rough couple of years. Oh, gosh. Uh, I have greatly enjoyed Sword and Sorcery, not because it's allowed me to flee from life, but because it's allowed me a brief refuge to catch my breath and then also filled me with feelings of energy uh, like this, uh, identifying with the, you know, I am who I am thing and taking that back out when I close the book into my day to day life. Personally, I'm biased, like I say, uh, maybe here, but I uh, I think that is what it really has to offer. And so would you say, coming off of what I'm saying and what you're saying here, would, what do you think about how maybe um, what this genre might give people that is like a vision for something new? It's not necessarily like a, a new utopia or whatever, because it is uh, rooted in these visions of past, you know, swords and sorcery. It's not called uh, driving my Dodge Charger to my job and sorcery. Uh <laughs> <laughs> what, what, what do you, sorry, I'm fumbling a bit here, but it's just I feel like we're so close to greatness or something interesting anyway. How, how can we take these these abstract feelings that this very past rooted genre can give a reader and then sort of turn them around and talk to people who aren't into the genre yet and be like, hey, man, this is something it can give you to help you imagine something better. Maybe it's not about imagining jetpacks or a cure for disease, but it's more about imagining you as a person who can better navigate uh, the the life. Yeah. And that's a vision for your a better future. Does that make any sense? What do you think? Absolutely. I would say it's not a genre of the past. And I can see where people would think it took me a while to like say, well, even even though Sword and Sorcery is all about the pre-modern, it's actually a presentist genre. It's about the present moment. What it does is it takes the individual, the protagonist, and the protagonist is often stripped of their social identity. So like uh, Elric of Melnabone, right? He's the emperor of uh, Melnabone. Conan is a Sumerian, right? There's all these traditions and there's always like kind of codes about how to be in that society. And they take the protagonist and they thrust them out of this kind of like tradition, basically. Like uh, like the, the, the sword and sorcery. A web of cultural obligation and norms, basically. Absolutely. Some people will say that the sword and sorcery hero is, is necessarily an alienated person or they're an outsider. I think that's fair to say, but I think it's because they start at home and they are kind of pushed into this place of alienation. Like they're not at home anymore. They're a wanderer. They're a stranger. They're a stranger. Yeah, they're Faffer and Grey Master coming out of their you know, origin stories into Lankmar. Yeah. And then because the worlds of sword and sorcery are very dangerous and you're always at risk of being killed. You're always on the cusp of being like physically deformed, right? Violence is always a threat. The sword and sorcery hero is always like, it's not like Tolkien, right? Tolkien is very, uh, like a high fantasy has this aesthetic of nostalgia where it's like, let's restore the broken world because the past was so much better. Let's get back to the Shire or let's have the king return. Sword and sorcery is let's not- Let's make a, the Shire great again. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> that was cheeky, but yeah. <laughs> sword and sorcery is not about this kind of backward looking nostalgia. And it's not about establishing a better future. It's about like kind of coming to terms with this the sword and sorcery protagonist is always at risk of basically like being killed. And what that does is it, it makes them exist in, in a certain way. Like I keep thinking about the speech that Conan gives in, um, oh my gosh, I'm blanking. Uh, it's the story with Belit. It's, I thought that's where you were going. Yeah, it's, yes, it's the famous um, speech that, that that he gives. Yeah, yeah. I, I will I will edit in me saying the name of the bloody story, but I okay. know the one you mean. Pirate of the Black Coast, I think. Something like that. Something with the Black Coast. The, yeah. I, but yes, the speech he gives yeah. about, you know, if this is an illusion, then I'm going to live life to the fullest anyway, because yeah. what difference does it bloody yeah. make? Yeah. yeah. And I don't think he's not advocating for the rock star life. Like, he's not saying, like, to hell with everyone. I'm just living in the present moment. I'm going to, like, screw it all. Like, 
Howard is writing this in 1932. He's writing this in the worst possible year. He's, you know, to go back to Viktor Frankl, like, am I comparing interwar America with something like the concentration camps? No, I'm not. I would never do that. But the Great Depression was a sh- really crappy time. The pandemic in 2020 was a really crappy time. Like, there are conditions of horribleness that, like, we need to kind of create some space and kind of think about who we are and kind of come to terms with, like, what's important. And because it's interesting, because if you read the Conan stories, they're masculinist, they're often misogynist. The main character character is a violent person, right? But my wife, she wrote an academic article about the feminist potential of sword and sorcery. She's really interested in why did C.L. Moore choose the genre of sword and sorcery to engage with? And this is not just anecdotal. Dungeons and Dragons, which I would argue is a gamified sword and sorcery, it doesn't just appeal to white guys, right? It appeals to all sorts of people. I think that it does provide that space to kind of construct identity. Like one of the first things that you, you do in Dungeons and Dragons is you create a character. You can play a character who's not who you are in, in actual real life. You can be someone completely different. This new movie just came out called Spine of the Night. Yes, yes. The protagonist of that film, well, there's several protagonists because it's a kind of an anthology. But I, you're thinking of the Swamp Witch, the Swamp whose actual Witch. name I always forget because Swamp Witch captivates my imagination. Yes, uh, voiced by Lucy Lawless, yeah. Exactly. Oh, and then another, like Xena Warrior Princess is this lesbian icon. You know, so like, I'm not sure how to wrap an intellectual bow on this, but I do think that as a kind of psychodrama space to kind of explore identity, Sword and sorcery, it's very useful. Well, here, maybe I'll try and put a bow on this. You let me know how badly I, I, I trip over my own shoelaces, maybe. I think what we're getting at here is that the vision for something new is not, like I say, like a, one of a, of a society per se. It's a vision of something, of, of a new self. Mm-hmm. A new and stronger, more capable self. And when I say strong, I don't just necessarily mean, I don't know, muscles or whatever. Mm-hmm. But like what's captivating, I think, about Conan and why we still talk about him and not so much about so many of the imitations that came later or other heroes from that era that aren't discussed as much is because of those moments of philosophy, like his speech in Pirates on the Black Coast. God damn it, Oliver, edit in the name of this. Hey, future Oliver here. The name of the story these two goofballs couldn't remember in the past was Queen of the Black Coast. All right, back to the interview. Uh, where, you know, it's the strength of character and this feeling of, as you say, not that he's going to be a rock star and screw everybody else. It's not a selfish thing. It's just this feeling of like, whatever this world is, whether it's illusion or not, I will be the most me that I can be. I will be the best self that I can be. I will live life to the fullest. I will say yes more than I will say no. And that is the vision for something new, maybe to a reader that Sword and Sorcery, I think, is so great at delivering. Mm -hmm. Uh, Does that sound, you know? Oh, absolutely. I have Viktor Frankl in the mind because I'm like halfway through uh, Man's Search for Meaning. He says that, I'm I'm paraphrasing Viktor Frankl, but he says, what is the meaning of life? That is not a question that we ask. That's a question that we're supposed to answer. Right. So it's like life asks us what is the meaning of life and we have to respond to it. And I feel like a lot of these characters, maybe they don't respond in the best ways. I mean, Conan, he's of gigantic mirth and melancholy. Right? Like he just keeps climbing the ladder until he is kind of sad in his throne room. You know, like a lot of the characters end up like uh, someone like Kane, for example, uh, Carl Albert Wagner. I'm not a psychologist and I would never say that he was a suicide, but, but he, he drank himself to death. Right. And Robert e. Howard killed himself. This is a very dark thing. I think the people who engineered and kind of developed this genre, they're clearly kind of responding to real life problems. Even though their fiction is about fantasy, it's actually about the stakes are high in, in what they're doing. Yeah, no, I, I totally get it. And even the ones who lived uh, long lives, like uh, Fritz Library, you know, obviously there's tragedy amongst all the swashbuckling mirth of Fafner and Grey Master. Oh, yeah. And C.L. Moore was definitely dealing with some pretty heavy subject matter in terms of all the illusions and not so veiled illusions to uh, sexual assault and violence stories, or some of her stories, not all of them, mm-hmm. uh, with Sherelle Lejeuri. And good old Michael Moorcock, who's still with us, bless him. You know, Elric is an unhappy guy uh, as he tries to be himself and not let others tell him who he is. Yeah. Uh, you know, as he, as he very quickly abdicates the throne uh, of his people, his his island of perverted elves. Yeah, um, <laughs> island anyway. of perverted elves. <laughs> more or less, more or less. All right, so I think we did some uh, some work there. Let's move on to the subject of community. The Whetstone Sword and Sorcery Tavern Discord server seems to me to be the most active online sword and sorcery community, at least as far as English language ones I'm aware of go. And many others I've spoken to about this agree with that assessment. As one of the people responsible for that server and that community, how do you feel that's come about? 
It began because of the pandemic. I use Discord for my classes. Um, when we went from in-person teaching to online teaching, one of the issues was, well, how are you going to have this informal office hours environment? You can't have that with the online, you know, I played around with the idea of like setting up Google Meets meetings and it didn't work. So I was in a World of Warcraft guild. We had a Discord server. And so I was like, I'm going to try this with my students, you know, because I'm always online. I have Discord on my phone. Long story short, that worked perfect for my classes. Dr. Carney's digital office office Discord server. And then uh, I participated in a lot of Sword and Sorcery Facebook groups. I took over as the moderator for the Sword and Sorcery Reddit. And the back and forth on those groups, it's asynchronous. And this was also a very political time, you know, so like a lot of the conversations, you know, veered away from Sword and Sorcery. Yeah, when I was first looking to see what Sword and Sorcery communities were out there, and I saw one Facebook group, which I won't name, especially because I can't quite remember the title anymore as I walked away, I saw on the about like, no politics, no opinions. I'm like, when people say no politics, what they generally mean is, uh, no opinions that force me to challenge what I believe in or anything that disagrees with what I think. And the people who say that tend to be like really reactionary, aggressive right wing, which I'm not. Yeah. So I just was like, thanks for the warning sign, backed away. Yeah, I know what you're talking about. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I won't go down the negative road, but you'll see the FAQ will say no politics. It really just means a certain kinds of politics, you know, or what they deem as politics. Exactly. Um, those groups were really hard to participate in because I would just want to talk about Fawford and the Gray Mauser and I would just leave angry. You know, someone would share a, a Trump meme or something like that. Like, I'm like oh, God. So those Facebook groups, they weren't doing it for me and started this Discord server. And it was just supposed to be for the editors and the um, couple of writers I know to, to talk about Whetstone and then started sharing the link and attached it to the Sword and Sorcery Reddit description and more and more people joined. And then next thing you know, it's now this, I can't keep up. I used to like just follow it all day long. And now there's there's so much activity on there. I, I can't keep up with all the, the, um, the conversation. Oh, that's really cool. I like that it started as kind of the Whetstone uh, magazine meeting room. Yeah. But then more and more other buggers kept wandering in <laughs> and started having like chats yes. in the corner or whatever <laughs> like, it's awesome okay cool all right um in our messaging running up to this interview regarding the whetstone server you mentioned it's kind of starting to get a literary salon atmosphere to it and then in the same digital breath and brackets you put a very pretentious analogy at the end of that sentence but as i responded in our chat i'd say the bracketed bit can just be cut. Because if there's one thing I'm tired of hearing people apologize for, it's sounding even remotely highbrow or aspiring to something other than, not necessarily better than, just other than, the lowbrow, especially when you can comfortably enjoy both. So, all right, let me climb off my soapbox uh, <laughs> and ask a question. <laughs> Please, without any worry of being judged, could you tell those listening who aren't familiar with the term literary salon, what it refers to, and why you felt inspired to say it? Well, I teach the history of literary criticism. And when you kind of tell that story, it starts in the 18th century. There were coffee houses in you know the UK. They're, they've kind of been romanticized as this like anti-hierarchical space. Like they were the penny universities. You know, coffee was really cheap. They weren't necessarily class exclusive. You could have an aristocrat sitting next to a guildsman, sitting next to a, a vicar. And there was this new print technology. You'd have like the broadsides and the single page periodicals. There's also tobacco and apparently uh, nicotine and um, caffeine work together to like expand their effects or and so long so short you have this like intellectual ferment and then in, a, in like 50 years you have like the age revolution i'm using broad strokes here mm -hmm. but like i love this image of like discussion of written material it, very intellectually vital and important activity and as far as the literary salon, you know, what, one of the issues with discussion online is it tends to be uh, sometimes not always superficial. So with Reddit, you get the echo chamber, like you have this, it's really cool. You get quality content goes to the surface because of the mm. upvoting, which is cool. You get some like in-depth commentary, but then with Twitter, you're limited to the very narrow length and discord. I think for a server to actually work, it has to be somewhat small and it also has to be somewhat focused. I haven't thought through this completely, but I think it creates this sort of perfect storm of in-depth conversation because it's the server's focus, but also intimacy and trust because the same people keep coming back. Well, you mentioned a half dozen names, me included, uh, so thank you, that was flattering, who you felt were contributing, especially to like getting good conversations going and maintaining them. And yeah, like one of the nice things about the Discord server I find is that it's not so large that it's impossible to keep keep up uh, with anything like because I mean keeping up with every single interaction on any server is a lot of work and this is a dead zone but I like that I can come there and there are certain channels that tend to have what I'm looking for and I can go there and find it and even if I don't interact I enjoy what I'm reading but I can also get my ore in 
and people respond and we get mm-hmm. a back and forth going. And I've already been having some really fun connections with people on there. Someone very kindly sent me an old Lancer paperback with the purple edges because I'm, I'm... Oh, that's awesome. My comic collector brain has l- latched onto that. <laughs> I got to get all the purple edges, man. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, little, little interactions like that or I helped somebody else get an issue of uh, Tales from the Magician Skull number two by connecting them to somebody else who had a spare and was willing to ship within the States. Oh, that's awesome. Little, little things like that. Just trading books is fun as well as ideas. And sometimes you see... Oh, there should be a there should be a book trading channel now. I don't know if that's a- <laughs> actually maybe maybe we're maybe we're we're hitting something here. Yeah. So yeah, I really like that, and it's funny because when someone writes a really long post on there, I'm into it. But when someone writes a Twitter thread of like ten or more tweets, I my eyes start to glaze over because it doesn't feel like the right pond to be swimming in for that kind of thing. And I my brain just goes, oh, for God's yeah. sake, write a blog post. But then I say that, and I don't read a lot of yeah. blog posts. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you know, I, I just, I just think, yeah, right. I, it took me a while to get into Discord, but this Whetstone was the server that made me go, okay, yeah, hmm. I think I like this. I think I can see how this can work. It's awesome, and I think you make a good point about how focus is a big part of it, and also uh, it can't be too too big maybe but also it can't be too small mm. you know a lot of those facebook groups have come across like bless them but they are generally speaking whistling graveyards with the occasional post of someone being like check out my thing and i'm guilty of it because i go there to be like hey check out my podcast right so i'm owning that but mm-hmm. when you have something that's nothing but like a, a semi-active repeater beacon for links to people's products there's no discussion mm-hmm. there's nothing much to really engage with and what i love about what you've co-created with the whetstone discord is there's something to engage with and there's a promotion channel where you can just funnel all that into that corner mm-hmm. <laughs> and even there people tend to react and be like oh yeah i just listened neat episode or you know and, and there'll be like a little discussion yeah. in there so again there's more engagement right yeah absolutely yeah i'm so intrigued by all of these new technologies and even academically my wife there's this field that she engages with academically called the digital humanities mm-hmm. She wrote her dissertation on this. It's now, it doesn't exist anymore. It was this website called protagonize.com. It was um, for collaborative storytelling. Basically, you could start a story and then another person could pick up, you know, the the thread and then another person could pick up the thread and there was speeches for comments. And so that might be a non sequitur, but the point I'm making is that something I learned about kind of being in her orbit is I've always been, I think we all are, like I've been very thoughtful about each of these technologies creates a certain kind of conversation. A certain kind of discourse is associated with that technology. It's not just like we're using these technologies and we have the same discourse and it's just like Twitter allows us to speak in a certain way and Facebook, it's like, no, each one of these digital contexts creates a different kind of conversation. Mm I'm really intrigued by, I've only tried it one time with this new one called um, Gather. Never heard of it. What's, what's Gather? Have you heard of that? Check it out. It's um, First off, it's really simplistic graphics, like two-dimensional graphics. It uses video and audio but you have an avatar. So it allows for a lot of people to gather together, but rather than everybody being part of like the same conversation, like a Google Meets conference call, you can have like clusters of conversation. And and when your avatars touch your camera and your audio turns on, people have done like academic conferences and things like that with this tech, but I don't think it's gripped yet. Maybe it won't, but I find it fascinating because I'm sure something like that has a potential for for um, gripping. So well, I like that you get a little space that you move around and uh, you know, simulating as if being in that you know meeting room or, or a party or whatever, and that attracts me more than Clubhouse, right? Which was like briefly the new hotness. I don't know if anybody's really using it now, and it's only been a few months. Oh yeah. But it was like, what if you had a massive conference call with strangers? And I was like, no, I don't. Yeah. Oh boy, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I have a friend who uses that. <laughs> yeah. And like, I, it doesn't, as you can tell, it's, it's, it didn't quite click with me. And especially because like, if I just wanted to do a live stream chat with say an audience, if I wanted to have that kind of interaction rather than a, a group of uh, essentially digital peers, you can live stream on YouTube, you can live stream on Twitch, you can live stream on my provider Podbean. Like, I mean, yeah, so there's no need for it. I wasn't sure what niche it filled. Mm-hmm. And it was especially a curious thing to launch. Like it both makes sense and makes no sense to me to launch it when everybody's suffering Zoom fatigue from the pandemic. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, just like, what is this thing you're exhausted by, but more and less control over what happens? <laughs> what? So, <laughs> That's funny. so yeah, yeah. But I mean, who knows? Maybe it's like with the uh, Discord, right? Which took me a minute to really get my head around what, how best to use it. And then Whetstone showed me, oh, yeah, it's a good place to have real time conversations. But nonetheless, I can sometimes come back and find the conversations that ended six hours ago and like, be like, oh, neat, and put my thought in. And then it revives, <laughs> you know, it's kind of a scratch and sniff situation with it. Yeah. So obviously, this is not your first online community. Do you have any advice for someone looking to build a literary community, either in person, like 
like a large book club or online because there are all kinds of pitfalls, I think. I mean, I've definitely had a reading circle that I left and was glad to have left, <laughs> you know? Mm -hmm. And then I talk about these whistling graveyards on Facebook, but then there's the stuff that works, you know? Sometimes people get a really good reading group going. Sometimes people get something like the Whetstone Discord online. It's just from your own experiences as a user and a creator, what are maybe some do's and don'ts or just some advice that you would give to someone looking to get a community going? That's such a fascinating uh, question. I have to like think about that because I really think it's having something that everyone is enthusiastic about is important. I know that's like a really generic answer, but... No, you need a focal point, yeah. Yeah. What's really intriguing is this activity has been going on for so long. Like the correspondence circles of the pulp era seems like it leads right into like the zine culture in the 1960s and 70s, leads into the amateur press associations like the Robert Howard Press Association, then magazines like Skelos and Whetstone. And let me think, what are some of the best principles? One of the things that I really try to do is to be hospitable with my feedback, be as generous as possible with my feedback because people will repay the favor. I love reading other people's books. I love reviewing their books. I love talking to them about their writing. And I think like, is there a principle where the more you give, the more you receive, like it just kind of naturally starts to happen. You know, like one of the best experiences I had was in graduate school in this dissertation writing group was I would submit some chapters and every single person in the group would come back with like a couple of pages of response. And like, I was like, so inspired by that. And it made me want to up my game and, and responding to them. So that's one of the, I guess, general principles would be like give in order to receive. I don't know if that's too generic and it sounds like I'm being a guru or something, but it, I no, know. I wouldn't say that. I think I will think about what I was saying before about how all those groups that kind of slowly become very quiet because it's nothing but people self-promoting all they're doing is trying to take they're not really giving fair, yeah fair enough so, yeah yeah you know i think it's very applicable also the facebook groups tend to have this um well i don't want to be negative but there are those like people who are like they have the self-published books and then they do like 12 like links in, in a row like you'll log on to the group and it's just like the same yeah yeah <laughs> the same person who's like flooding the group yeah and not trying to start any conversation there's about the book or the subject matter they're just posting their blurb of the book and it's like in a world where a guy had his mom <laughs> get killed by a dog yeah, by this exactly and i was just like what do you what am i what where's where's my where does well uh, to use a word you did a minute ago I, what i liked uh, where's my grip yeah you know where's the traction for this thing i'm just sliding off your <laughs> badly photoshopped cover like i just you know sorry i have friends who engage in that practice practice. <laughs> it's like, I don't want them to feel guilty if they hear me criticize. Well, me. Maybe, like, maybe wanna... they and others in the world, including myself at one point, because I mean, I had to learn this lesson. I felt uh, we need to learn there's better ways to get people's attention. And then if you turn yourself into a human spam bot, <laughs> you are not only being priming yourself to be ignored, which is the opposite of your flipping goal. You're also kind of becoming a detriment to the places where you advertise because you are lowering the grade of, of discourse in these groups. People can't see me nodding along, so I'm nodding along. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Ah, uh, <laughs> uh, the medium. Uh, yes, audio. Uh, but, yes. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, that's my feeling. And I think sometimes to come back to what you said about generosity, there's negativity, which is to give something that is not remotely actionable. And it's perhaps you just getting out your frustrations, which like, no, don't do that, I think. But then there's the generosity of letting someone know when they're stepping into a tar pit. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't think it's generous not to tell them that. And so when I, you know, recently I had someone who was writing me uh, emails and they were they were asking a bit more than I could give back, mm -hmm. right? They were friendly and generous, but they were giving asking me way more than I could give back in terms of questions and continue to check out this. And, you know, hey, buddy, I'm like, buddy, we just you just emailed me the first time. They also gave me one bit of grip that I tried to really use in the email where they were like, yeah, you know, I had a form interaction that was kind of rough on one of the sword and sorcery forums. I wonder what that was about. Maybe I need to learn how to do emails and forum stuff better. It's hard to reach out to strangers. And I was like, okay, there we go. Mm -hmm. There you're giving me like real human connection and I can do something with that. Mm -hmm. And so I said, I asked permission, which I always try to do uh, I said, may I give you some advice? They said, yes. I said, okay. And then I wrote what I, was, I ended up being kind of lengthy bullet point list of advice of just what I felt was a good way to interact with strangers when you're networking based on my own experiences, rules that I myself try and live by when I reach out to people, say, as guests for this podcast. Mm -hmm. And they said, thank you very much. And uh, I haven't gone back to me about it. Uh, not that they have to, mm -hmm. but uh, I guess, yeah. So come back to what we're talking about community, I guess, right? Because that's community. Even if it was private email, it came out of the sword and sorcery uh, online stuff. It's like that person, I hope, I think, will benefit more from me saying, hey, you want to improve in this thing. Here's ways you can improve. 
And there are ways that absolutely, like I didn't cite things from his email that he sent to me, but he'd have to be pretty dim not to make the connection mm -hmm. that I was citing some stuff from his email indirectly. Mm -hmm. And it definitely showed in the response, which was very clear and focused compared to what they initially sent me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I just, my point is this, like I think um, there's a difference between negativity and critique and we would all be better advised to remember it yeah. and be a little less afraid of hurting other people's feelings and more afraid of, or not afraid, I don't even want to use that word, but more just cognizant of how we present our ideas. Absolutely. Like think more about how you're presenting then like i don't know oh, i don't want to hurt someone's feelings because that just makes everybody kind of like twitter and flutter and nothing productive comes out of it an analogy would be gaming and gaming if the dungeon master bequeaths their responsibility to kind of enforce a certain mode of comportment in the game then like the game doesn't work right you can have somebody who will destroy the game maybe we need to bring some of uh, game master judge ethic into our online <laughs> Yeah. Like communities, honestly, yeah, yeah. Like I, we've all had uh, those of us who who enjoy that hobby have all played at a table with a game master or judge or whatever who can't say no, and that yeah, that seems cool at first, but next thing you know, <laughs> all yeah. this is total yeah. you know player versus player. Everybody's trying to murder each other, and they built secret crime empires or whatever, and it's just like what happened to like the group <laughs> game. <laughs> <laughs> so okay so uh you know a focal point for the community generosity and how you interact with others definitely it does create a reciprocal cycle like i just yeah. feel better when i do that kind of thing heck i you know on the nanorimo channel of the whetstone discord i'm not participating mm -hmm. in nanorimo this year i never have actually because i never seem to be in sync with november every time it rolls around i'm like none of my projects are at the right stage same however i have been very sincerely dipping in there to occasionally like give people encouragement who are posting their word counts or somebody was like i don't know if i should keep posting my word count and i was like do it man it's fun yeah you know and i mean every goddamn word i'm saying because not only is it nice to put that positivity out to the other people it's just making the room smell nicer or something you know what i mean it's like an air freshener yeah. to be positive in these spaces rather than negative. And I mean, we can all occasionally buy in on all right, here's the time where we're all going to bitch on this one show that did something we don't like. Like if you're as a group being like, let's have some fun and do that. Sure, of course. But I do generally speaking, try to avoid also describing what I like in terms of how it's better than something else that I think sucks. Because mm -hmm. then you're almost certainly stepping all over somebody else's thing, you know? And you're not talking about what makes your thing that you like special. You're talking about what makes something else in your opinion stink. So how does that even sell the thing that you like? How are you getting people to come into it? It makes me think of this book reviewer I know who's a pretty successful celebrated book reviewer and journalist and was talking to this person they were like i don't review books i don't like and it like blew my mind it was like if they're reading a book and they don't like it it's like that's not what i'm going to review because my impression is like no it's part of a critic to kind of assess and judge things that are good and bad objectively but this person's response was no if i i'm going to spend my time writing and talking about things that i like so like that's kind of something i try to Every now and again, I can't help myself, particularly if I feel like the writer or the book has enough support. The writer's not going to like, you know, stop writing and- Go out of business because <laughs> of you. Yeah, out, yeah they're, like, they're big enough to take it. I know the feeling, yeah. I don't particularly care for the Gentleman Bastards book, The Lies of Locke Lamora. Okay. It's just gonna work for me. His prose is just too gushing. He doesn't care. He's not gonna like stop writing because of what, but I'm not gonna spend my time reviewing and talking about it. I'm also not gonna go around and like talk about how much I hate things. Because the reason why this is, I think we even do this is because of, of love for this mm -hmm. stuff. Like we, we love this stuff you know yeah like it's one thing if you're, if you're sparking discussion if you're like well i didn't care for this aspect of gentleman bastard structure because blah what do you guys think you know is it just my you know something i care about personally or is there maybe something more broadly speaking that could have been improved there and like what would you do right like if you put out a question but yeah when someone's just like spitting venom <laughs> yeah, I have a lot of friends who, well, when they do it comically, it's great. I have a lot of friends who just like dump on stuff. Oh, well, sure. Yeah. Like I say, sometimes you just got to, you know, sort of close the window or the door so, and, and be like, okay, here's what we're doing. <laughs> we're shitting on this thing uh, <laughs> that we all agree on. Yeah. And it's fun. And yes, it can be very, very funny. I mean, yeah. think about how many YouTubers make careers out of just like being the guy who, you know, usually a guy uh, who craps on things. Yeah. But that's like a, you know, a top down hierarchical kind of thing. When we're talking about like uh, peers in the community, mm -hmm. I think it needs to be framed a kind of discussion and raise issues rather than be just like, I hate this thing and people who like it are bad yeah. and should feel bad. So yeah, other than focal point generosity, I think you mentioned earlier picking the right social platform or medium or whatever, mm -hmm. or, it's, or, or in real life physical space, you know, when that's a little easier to do, that's conducive to the kind of conversations you want to have. Like, you know, it seems like we've come to the feeling that Discord feels like a good medium. When it's come to real life, just like writers clubs, checking out each other's samples and stuff, you know, like what has worked for you when you've done that? I'm presuming you have, I suppose, but uh, have you? Yeah. Well, when I moved to to Virginia for my job, first thing I did was I looked if there were any writing centers in the area. We have the Muse Writer Center in Norfolk, which is about 30 minutes 
depending on traffic away from me. Got in touch with those people. I took a couple of classes. You know, there's writers conferences. Have you been to any of the writers conferences like uh, AWP or one that we have in Sarah? It's called the Hampton Roads Writers Conference. There's agents who will be there. You can pitch your ideas to. There's workshops about characterization. There's genre specific workshops. A lot of the uh, smaller science fiction and fantasy conventions, the local and the regional sci-fi and fantasy conventions have great writers tracks, at least the ones I've been to. And I end up meeting a lot of people that way. Is this, is this answering the question that well, you Well, I mean, we're getting into the physical territory. And uh, yeah, so when, when your experiences with those, which I frankly, I need to do more of, or when it's easier to do more of it, again, pandemic, uh, yeah, you know, I, yeah. I did do Howard Andrews. I just described a couple of years ago, actually. Yeah, that's no, all good. I mean, though, I did do a, um, a course with Howard Andrew Jones through Muse, uh, his heroic fiction writing. Oh, so cool. that was pretty cool. Uh, and got chatting with a couple of the yeah. classmates uh, in private afterwards, so online private. So yeah, so yeah. I've, I've had a little taste of it and gone to one or two other things, but it's something I definitely need to like stick my nose into more. So uh, maybe uh, as a final question before we tie this off, because uh, man, have I got a lot of interview, but I'm enjoying it. I'm, I'm really enjoying talking <laughs> with you, so it's all worth it. Uh, Same here. Absolutely. What, um, in your experiences with those real life spaces, writing community spaces, what is like one thing that really worked for you and one thing that really didn't? Something that really worked for me was I had a, an instructor who was, well, let me back up a little bit. The best literature course I had in graduate school, he ended up being on my dissertation committee. His name was um, Michael Clune, and he was just really into what he was teaching. Like we read Nabokov's Lolita, which is a very controversial novel. And I remember thinking to myself like, uh, I don't know if I really like this novel, but he was able to convince me these uh, compelling things that Nabokov was doing. And we read some Willa Cather and, and like, you get a lot of people in graduate school who you take their classes and this is me, I'm like kind of criticizing academia for a second. Sure. And it's more just about like, I am this great scholar and I have these ideas that I want to share. And it's more like the classroom space becomes about their vision of this work. Clune's class was like, I'm just 100% over the moon for this material. And let me explain why I think this uh, material was important. So it's like they were egoless. Mm. You're reminding me of an experience I had years ago with a screenwriting course where it essentially solidified something I've really tried to bring to this podcast, uh, which is I'm a big fan of if you are going to be trying to teach others, whether through sharing peer to peer or getting up on that podium and having the hierarchy of giving people tools they can pick up or put down and use. Mm -hmm. I am not a big fan of dogma, mm -hmm. which invariably is something like what you just described, where the presenter is like, how I think or how I write is the way to think or write. Mm -hmm. Absorb this or be a failure in my eyes. Mm -hmm. Because and I, I feel like I shouldn't have to explain why that stinks, but you know, you still run into it in the world. So I guess I, I can give my 10 cents on it, which is, uh, of course, it stinks mm -hmm. because like your experiences aren't universal, buddy. And mm -hmm. oftentimes there are flaws you're not even seeing because you're so in love with the smell of your own farts. You know, I had a screenwriting teacher who <laughs> his thing was, why would you ever want to have a story about a character that you wouldn't want to hang out with? And, I'm, and my head just exploded with like a thousand movies I could think of where I loved watching them over and over, but I would never want to spend time with, uh, I don't know, uh, Tom Cruise's character from Magnolia is uh, the worst. <laughs> But I love watching them. Like, it's just such a dumb thing. But this teacher who was getting paid, who I had paid money uh, to go down to the course, was giving me dogma. And it was dogma that was extremely narrow minded and rooted to, to boot. Like, I mean, sure, we have to have some rules like you know, of grammar or whatever so we can communicate with each other in a commonly understood fashion. But by and large, like, I think the best thing you can do is challenge that kind of dogma and try and give people tools, which funny enough brings me back to that book by Matthew Sales, as I mentioned earlier in this interview. So I should probably link it uh, to it in the blood description. Maybe I should try and have him on. Sorry, man. Uh, <laughs> I keep talking about that, but just what we're talking about keeps making my mind come back to that because that's what it does. It challenges dogma uh, related to workshops in particular. So yeah, it sounds like what you prefer, uh, what works for you are presenters, teachers, whatever, speakers who are somewhat egoless and are like, here, I'm sharing a thing with you. I'm not pounding it into your skull. Yeah, the subject under discussion is more important than their vision of it or their interpretation of it. It's like we're all in that coffee house talking about the uh, periodical where the ink is still drying, right? Like we're just... Um, well, this always teaches. Our, our attention is oh, focused sorry, sorry, on this <laughs> thing. Oh, no, 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 please. Yeah, please, I'm just so excited. Uh, uh, do, you ever, you, do you ever have that experience? I've heard professors tell me where, like, you know, they felt like they were presenting a subject they've, they've been teaching for years, they know inside out, and then a student, like a fresh-faced student, teaches them some new angle just in their reaction to the text. Absolutely. That's one of the things that constantly surprises me is I've been teaching for 16 years, and I will teach some of the same fiction, and students will make me see things in a novel or, you know, they'll respond to a 
creative writing prompt in a way that I completely wasn't expecting. We are like extremely creative as a species. <laughs> but um, I, I want to mention this book before I forget it off the top of my head. It's uh, by um, Mark McGurl, a literary scholar. It's called The Program Era. Have you heard of this? No, I haven't. I'm writing it down right now. The Program Era. It's about the effect of the creative writing workshop <laughs> on post-war American fiction. And it's not necessarily negative, but it's not a flattering vision either. You don't have the creative writing program show up until after World War II. I'm generalizing. There are probably a couple of creative writing programs, but like the academization of creative writing doesn't happen until you know the post-war period and it changes American fiction. Arguably it homogenizes mm. it. Because people talk about like modernist literature, it's the pound era, right? Ezra Pound told everybody to make it new and like but so when Mark McGraw writes the book, The Program Era, it's a play on this idea of the pound era. It's like the creative writing program era this dogmatic approach to teaching of creative writing has like shaped the fiction that we've written in this way. And it's, it's really eye opening because it makes you think about how like what's going on in creative writing workshops changes the fiction being written. We might have to do a mini book club of two here or something like I'm going to read the program or maybe you'll read Craft in the Real World because it seems like there's a lot of connection between the two and that Craft in the Real World is some of the stuff that you're telling me. And it suggests the idea um, that it was a way of packaging American culture norms and ways of thinking mm -hmm. and making it something more easily mass uh, marketable. And not that there was like one secret hidden Illuminati figure who was like, ah, yes, we will make writing yeah. workshops as a way of infecting others with American thinking. But nonetheless, something along those lines kind of just, I don't know, semi-organically happened because of the way it, these workshops were invariably with a very, uh, not at all remotely diverse groups, for sure, for a long time as well, were just condensing themselves and then putting it out into the world in fiction. Mm -hmm. And everybody else reads that and goes, well, I guess that's storytelling. Yeah. You know, and then now fast forward to the present and I see people who come from different cultures who are very annoyed when they get critiques about their fiction that amount to basically saying this is not like American fiction, mm -hmm. even though that's not what the critique is usually saying. It's more like, oh, well, the plot doesn't do this or this, this, the character doesn't do that. And there's too much coincidence. And the person's like, well, I'm from Korea. We do it, you know, like we have a different storytelling tradition or whatever. Yeah, that's so compelling. Yeah. 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 So, and, and I think what well, this is maybe a way that we can we can tie this off uh, before the actual like outro bit that we do uh, usually here. We it's just me doing this podcast. Uh, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> me and the, the the so I'm running a novel institute. <laughs> I think it's really good, even if you're not big into like reading or more academic thinky texts or whatever about writing. If you are writing, it is worth taking a peek at some of these things because I'm telling you, listener, it is like getting to see like the code of the matrix sometimes when it's good when it's popping and you read this stuff and then you're like oh i never realized that's why i think that way about x about plot about character oh it actually makes me better understand why i like and dislike certain things and maybe it's opening my world up wider so i can get more out of more things and just like have a richer life as a reader and creator you know, it just has such great value. So certainly, uh, wow, I just went so past my question. So uh, very quickly, the back end of my question, which was what's one thing that works, one thing that really didn't for you in those spaces, other than someone just, you know, I don't know, putting their hand up and being like, Hitler had some good ideas, like other than just like, oh, you know, the most obvious, like moron, bigot, stupidity, whatever. What is something, uh, maybe is the, maybe you actually had it in your answer as well, right? People being overly dogmatic. Uh, but is there maybe something that you find sometimes can sabotage, whether immediately or over time, literary circles of people reading and writing and giving critiques or something like that like what's like one good thing to try and look out for if you're trying to get something like that going like disingenuous engagement mm -hmm. uh disingenuous compliments mm -hmm. um, i find those really disheartening sometimes a compliment like a lackluster compliment can be just as demotivating as like um this sucks I get a lot of people who, I get a lot of students who will read my fiction like, this is great. And then I have to remind myself, like, I'm also in charge of their grade. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> and I, and did they really even read? And so like, I appreciate anyone who I'm not like, oh, you, you should stop what you're doing and read everything I wrote as closely with as much attention as possible. Like, I'm not making that demand, but you can tell when somebody cares about you and they're engaged in what they're doing versus somebody who's like completely diffused and distracted and just, they're not there. Right. Yeah, well, it's more satisfying to have someone say, you know, we're in a funny way. Uh, it's more satisfying to have someone say, yeah, I, I'm sorry, man, the story didn't really grab me. Then it had great um, adjectives. Commas. <laughs> yeah. The commas were good, man. Yeah, no, I run yeah. into that with film and TV where sometimes if someone's like, yeah, really like the lighting, you know. <laughs> Yeah. I mean, maybe they did, That's but hilarious. you know, <laughs> there's a way of it's said that you're like, yeah, okay, all right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, 
oh my gosh, I recently did this opera project at CNU. And that was one of the best writing experiences I've ever had because you get feedback from the composer, you get feedback from the director, you get feedback from the set designers, you get feedback from the dramaturg, right? There was a scholar who came and talked about it. And it's like, I can see where people working on television and for the stage can really get addicted to this like collaborative nature of that kind of writing. Whereas when you're writing fiction, you're by yourself and you share it with people and hopefully you get some kind of interactivity. I was, I was, I was thinking about um, when you're talking about writing for television. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it has its ups and downs, right? Because sometimes you want all that interaction with other people and like, it's really cool. And then sometimes everybody's giving you opinions and, you're, and you you don't have Oh, that's move. the worst. You know, everybody's like, I think the dog should be blue. And you're like, all right, all right, all right. I gotta, I gotta close, you know, the circle for a second and then I'll open up again later when it feels right. Uh, when all is said and done, thank you so much for giving me your time. Thank you. Where can people, you know, who've enjoyed hearing you speak, where can people find you and what have you got coming down the pike, if anything, that you want to share? If, I mean, more whetstone is a perfectly acceptable answer, right? you know, but uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. what's, uh, what's, what's yeah. you know, where if people want to find you on Twitter or something, like where can they find you? Yeah, I'm at, at JR Carney52 is my Twitter handle. I'm on the Whetstone Discord. I'm JRC on the Whetstone Discord. I'm working on a lot of stuff. A lot of it is like academic stuff. I've been having a lot of trouble with carving out time for creative writing. So hopefully that changes in the future. That's really boring. I don't really have a, no, I have no, so no, many. No, no, there's no wrong answer. Like I, it's a question that we're like, I want to give you the chance to present yourself to people, but also yeah. I appreciate it can sound like, well, what have you done to justify your existence? And are you really <laughs> exciting? Do you have like seven movies and three books and four <laughs> interpretive dances coming down the pipe? No, but like <laughs> you're doing whetstone. Like that'll like, that's why, you know, that was the first reason I, I thought to have you here. And there's more of that coming, right? And also you, you uh, with your partners, just opened Witch House, right? The Cosmic Horror mm -hmm. Sibling. Yes, yes. And uh, what is it? Whetstone.blogspot.com? Or what's the, what's, the, what's the address? Whetstonemag.blogspot.com. Yeah, if you go to whetstone.blogspot.com, it's a weird website that's not Whetstone. Uh, it's all about like sharpening swords on stones or something. I don't know. Uh, and and which house is that? Which house mag dot .com? Yeah, which house mag dot .com. Yes. Awesome. Yep. All right. Well, I will put clickable links to those in the show notes. But nonetheless, it's always good to say these things out loud. Mm -hmm. And I will put a link to the Discord, which does die after seven days. Final question: Are you aware of a way to make a permanent link to the Discord? <laughs> Yeah, there is a permanent link on the Whetstone website. If you click about the very bottom, there's the, our Twitter link, our Facebook link, and there's a permanent link there. So oh, you can join okay. it that way. Well, there yeah. you go. Thank yeah. you for teaching me yeah. one more very useful thing, Jason. And thank you so much for your time. <laughs> That's one thing. <laughs> All right. <laughs> one of many. All right. Well, thanks so much for being with us. Take care, man. Thank you. So I Am Writing a Novel features original music by Gloria Guns and is hosted by yours truly, Oliver Brackenbury. If you'd like to submit a question, then please email it to so I'm writing a novel at gmail.com. Bonus points if you record yourself and send me an MP3 I can cut into the show. Doesn't have to be fancy. Using your phone is fine. Just keep it clear and concise. You can also holler at the show on Twitter. Look for at so underscore writing. That's at so writing. Please consider sharing the show with anybody who might like it, leaving a review on Apple Podcasts, and checking out patreon.com slash so I'm writing a novel. Patrons get to be thanked in the final novel, listen to episodes of the podcast a week early, and even enjoy a bonus podcast called So I Wrote a Novel, where I read and comment on chapters of previous works, starting with my first novel, Junkyard Leopard. Thanks for hanging out with me, and Jason, and I'll see you soon. <laughs>